everyone. Well, um, I'm Diane Linehan. I'm the Director of Operations for PMSF. Um, and it is my extreme pleasure um, to welcome you today to our We Are Family virtual conference. Um, today's session is a panel from Clemson University researchers. They're going to tell us about their wonderful work in their uh, PMSF research initiative. And um, we have a guest moderator today, Andy Mitz. And um, I will introduce him after a couple of housekeeping items. I do have a message from our sponsor. Our mission at Jaguar is to accelerate breakthroughs in gene therapy for patients with severe genetic diseases. With gene therapy, we can give the opportunity at a better life. That's what makes Jaguar special. Let me introduce Andy Mitz. Andy is a PMS father. Um, his son David was born before PMS was recognized um, as a syndrome. And then a few years after that, Andy and his wife had another very similar child who died shortly after birth. And after identifying two other cousins with PMS, Andy was able to trace the origins of his family's PMS back five generations, back to roots in Eastern Europe. And he's also a PhD scientist who works in brain research. And although it's not his main focus, Andy has published on genetics and molecular biology of PMS. He writes a blog on PMS science and he encourages other scientists to study PMS related issues. So Andy, um, I wanna extend a uh, warm welcome and thanks for agreeing to moderate today. Yeah, thank you for that uh, introduction. Um, my primary role is to introduce um, um, Luigi and uh, Sarah. Um, uh, we're gonna hear from these two longstanding PMS scientists, Sarah Sarasoa, who co-founded the Clemson University Fallon McDermott Syndrome Research Initiative, and Dr. Luigi Bocuto, who's joined that initiative. Um, backgrounds, Luigi is a medical scientist who specializes in clinical genetics. He studies the molecular biology and the clinical consequences of PMS genes. He's currently a clinical associate professor in the Clemson School of Nursing. He's highly published on intellectual disability, autism, cancer, liver disorders, and metabolic disorders. His papers explore many different PMS genes and how they affect brain, kidney, liver, and other organs. He's always been an active member of our community, attending our events and conferences. He's a member of the Foundation Scientific Advisory Committee. On a personal note, I wanna add that Luigi has always been generous with his time and modest about his contributions. Sarah is a PhD genetic epidemiologist and an assistant professor in the School of Nursing. She holds degrees from top institutions, including University of California, Berkeley and Clemson University. She has published 15 papers on Phelan McDermott syndrome and is consistent and constantly seeking ways to sharpen our understanding of PMS by bringing together researchers of different disciplines to focus on our population. Her landmark paper in 2014, co-authored with Luigi, Curtis Rogers, Katie Fallon, and others, established the foundation of our understanding of what deletion size means. This and her, and her related papers address fundamental questions. What does it mean to have a big deletion, a small deletion, or an interstitial deletion? Important papers by others have their foundation in Sarah's work. So let me hand this over to Luigi and Sarah and uh, thank them for being here. Uh, thank you very much, Andy, for the beautiful introduction. I would like to say that uh, I'm honored to call Andy not, not just a friend, but a brilliant collaborator. Eh? Andy is uh, a, an incredible source of uh, uh, inspiration uh, and uh, uh, suggestions as our uh, publication history uh, speak uh, extensively about. Um, we're very happy to be here. Um, we're very happy to get in contact, if not in person yet, hopefully in the uh, near future we'll, we'll get back in person together, but at least we're, we're happy to establish this online contact with, uh, with the families, with the foundation. And uh, um, we're going to give you a, a brief overview of, of some of the projects that are currently ongoing, because thanks to uh, our very uh, productive activity of our, all our collaborators and students that, that Sarah will, will quickly and, and shortly introduce. Um, we, we're involved in, in so many projects. So uh, without further ado, I'll let uh, Sarah 
lead you through our research initiative. All right. Well, good morning, everyone. And we are really delighted to be here to share with you um, some of the work that we're doing at Clemson University and the uh, Phelan McDermott Syndrome Research Initiative that we've uh, put together. So I'll share my slides. All right. Everyone see my slides? OK. First, I want to tell you a little bit about us. So you know, who are we? So um, we are uh, based in the Clemson University School of Nursing. And School of Nursing, we actually have two facilities. One is on the main Clemson University campus, which is where we're sitting today in Edwards Hall. We also have a brand new Clemson University nursing building in Greenville, which sits on the Prisma Health Campus. And we have a healthcare genetics and genomics interdisciplinary doctoral program. So we're a program um, where we emphasize, um, we welcome people from many different disciplines, all looking at research, uh, genetics related research that affects um, human health. We have students who come from many different backgrounds, so nurses, other healthcare providers, we've had PAs, uh, laboratory researchers, bioinformaticists, such as uh, Sneha right here, um, health professions, educators, um, risk communication, um, many different backgrounds. Um, people can be on campus or they can be distance learners because some of our people are full-time working professionals who have great skills, um, who are passionate about um, continuing their education and we let them do that. Okay, and then we also have a laboratory um, here in Clemson where we can do uh, laboratory based work, primarily with cell culture. So we formed this Phelan McDermott Syndrome Research Initiative, and this was intentional, uh, looking to collaborate with people um, across the university. So we've got um, different investigators from, I think it's four different departments now. We've got our School of Nursing, we have our public health sciences, we have biological sciences, and we also have anthropology. Um, and it's all to comprehensively investigate disorders. And that's what the ultimate goal to look for precision medicine and improvements there. So here is a picture. So you get to know some of the team members and not, not everyone is able to be here. So um, on the right here, we have Dr. Kara Powder. She is with uh, Department of Biological Sciences. We have Dr. Katie Wiesensee. Um, she is the department chair in anthropology, sociology, and criminal justice. And she's the one who was conducting the 3D morphometric study some people might be familiar with. Um, up here on the left, we have Snehal Shah, who is also with us today. Thank you, Snehal, who is um, a graduate student. We have Dr. Jane DeLuca, who's not, she's teaching right now. She is a, a, a nurse scientist and uh, looks especially at metabolic disorders. And here in this picture here, we have our graduate student, Ethan Wilson. Here's me. We have Dr. Donna Weinbrenner, who's doing a lot of data analytics with us. We have Brianna Dyer uh, in the middle, who is a graduate student. We have Dr. Bridget Moffitt, who is right with us today. So she has graduated her PhD, which she did on PMS. Um, we have Luigi, and then we have Dr. Diana Ivankovic, who is very active uh, developing laboratory methods for our investigations. Um, some of the people not pictured, Dr. Lior Rennert, who is a biostatistician, and Sarah Quadri, who is a speech language pathologist. And she's currently doing her PhD with us, and she's looking at uh, language and communication in PMS. So some of you may not really know where, we, where we're located. So where is Clemson? So we have a map here. Uh, this is South Carolina. Some people may know us because of Myrtle Beach um, on the coast or down here to Hilton Head and here's Charleston. But if you go uh, Northwest up into the mountains, this area, this is where we're located. So here's Clemson's Spain campus. Here is Greenville and down here is Greenwood. So this is home of the Greenwood Genetic Center. And um, I did my PhD at Clemson and I did my work with the Greenwood Genetic Center and I postdoc with the Greenwood Genetic Center. And since then, I never really left Phelan McDermott Syndrome research. So, um, so uh, I guess where you get your roots is where you keep, keep growing. Okay, and now I'm gonna turn it over to Luigi and he's gonna talk, um, take over from here. Okay, thank you, Sarah. So um, in this, uh, era after the publication of the Human Genome Project. Some of you may wonder 
what is left to analyze in, in terms of genetics. And especially for families with filament dermid, uh, the diagnosis implies uh, already to have a genetic characterization of the main abnormality causing the clinical presentation. So what is left to do in terms of research? Uh, based on the um, new uh, awareness of the multiple genomic implications uh, and the different clinical presentations, we developed approaches based uh, on uh, the idea of providing uh, uh, precision medicine. And um, these approaches were based on uh, certain, uh, certain parameters. One is deep phenotyping, which means basically uh, getting more into details of the clinical signs and symptoms that uh, individuals with PMS present. So deep phenotyping uh, is based uh, on standard instruments, mostly questionnaires, uh, standardized questionnaires, um, data repositories and registries like the uh, Filament Dermid Syndrome Data Hub, formerly known as the PMS International Registry, um, because in that way we can have a, a more thorough data collection uh, and also a more focused data collection uh, through the questionnaires that, that will allow us to investigate better the different shades of uh, the uh, clinical presentation. This is important because then it will help us to correlate the phenotype, so the clinical traits, with the genotype. Therefore, the next uh, parameter is the expanded genomic investigation. As I was saying, um, all the families have already received their genetic diagnosis, so they already know uh, if their children have uh, a deletion on the 22Q13 region or they have a shank free pathogenic variant. But what we're trying to do is to investigate abnormalities beyond the major clinic, the major uh, genetic abnormality that might still affect the clinical presentation. So detecting variants that might modulate the severity of the presentation or that might interfere with the genes preserved on the other copy of the uh, chromosome 22 q Thank you. And then the third uh, aspect is the functional characterization. So we are uh, performing uh, experiments uh, focused on metabolic profiling, but we're also considering other approaches of the so-called omics. So transcriptomics, so the product of the genes in terms of uh, transcript mRNA, proteomics, so the proteins produced by these genes, then metabolomics and so on. And uh, some of these are helpful to investigate the pathogenic mechanisms underlying the clinical features. Some of these are focused on identifying biomarkers. So molecular or metabolic abnormalities that can be correlated to uh, specific uh, uh, clinical traits. And then the last point is personalized treatment. So all of these is obviously focused on providing a better treatment. So identifying the best candidate compounds, identifying the best candidate subjects that can undergo clinical trials and uh, assessing potential uh, side effects. So the combination of the deep phenotyping, the expanded genomic investigation, the functional characterization uh, ultimately is finalized to provide a better personalized treatment. So when we talk about uh, filament dermid syndrome, we have to consider the uh, variability in the clinical presentation. I'm sure that uh, the families or physicians, I don't know who is connected or who will uh, look at the uh, recording, they have encountered uh, at least some of these traits listed here. You can see in the top part of the list, some neurodevelopmental traits like neonatal hypotonia, developmental delay or intellectual disability, autism spectrum disorder, which is quite, quite common in the PMS population. Uh, and then uh, going down that list, you see sleep disturbances, seizures, and then we go to conditions that are not neurological per se, like uh, kidney problems, uh, dysmorphic traits, gastrointestinal issues. So uh, you can tell already that uh, there is a, a broad range of uh, clinical abnormalities. And the key point is that uh, development dermid syndrome is not just a neurodevelopmental disorder because you can see there is systemic involvement, but definitely the key take home message is that there is clinical variability because you may have variability in terms of age of onset, severity, regression, and so on. And then 
moving to the genetic cost, so the etiology, what causes PMS, um, we have uh, uh, the original description as 22Q13 deletion syndrome to differentiate uh, from other um, deletion syndromes on chromosome 22. And uh, mostly they were caused by uh, loss of the terminal portions of chromosome 22 of the long arm, so the Q arm of chromosome 22. As you can see here in this picture identified by the arrow, this is a relatively large portion that is lost. So these cases were the first ones detected when the, the syndrome was first described due to the um, uh, available technology. But with the refinement of the technology, we were able uh, to detect uh, other cases that were caused by not only terminal deletions, but uh, deletions and duplications, as you can see in this picture where the uh, red bars are deletions, the blue bars are duplications. So you can see more complex rearrangements involving the 22Q13 region. Uh, there were cases with interstitial deletions as depicted in the first two red bars at the very top of the, of the figure. And then with the availability of uh, new technologies like uh, um, uh, chromosome microarrays, uh, CGH microarrays, or uh, large uh, um, genomic sequencing technologies, next generation sequencing, uh, new cases were detected, and even cases with uh, pathogenic variants, so point mutations, changes in the gene sequencing affecting the Shank3 gene. They are also causative of, of PMS. So you can see that the clinical variability is matched by an extensive genomic and genetic variability as well, where we have cases with uh, small deletions that could be as small as 100 kilobases, so 100,000 nucleotides, all the way up to nine megabases, so over nine million nucleotides. Wow. Yeah. And you can see that there are no recurring deletion cycles. So it's always variable. So every patient may have its own history in terms of genetic abnormality and, of course, in terms of clinical presentation. So our um, research initiative uh, has been uh, focused so far on uh, uh, certain uh, approaches. The first approach is to investigate the uh, potential genotype-phenotype correlation. So the um, interaction between uh, uh, genetic or genomic uh, abnormalities and certain clinical traits. As you can see from this list, we have identified certain features of interest, and some of them have been described, have been sorry, suggested by the families themselves, like seizures, sleep disturbances, uh, kidney disorders, behavior disorders, and especially the ones related to autism, uh, lymphedema that we will see more in details, head size, speech language impairment, and uh, uh, other neurological features that were analyzed through a bioinformatics approach. The uh, second point is about uh, an, another strategy of investigation that we applied that is focused on characterizing the metabolic response to candidate compounds. Particularly, as Dr. Moffitt will uh, describe, we focused on the response to uh, IGF-1 and HGH, so insulin-like growth factor one and uh, human growth hormone, because they have been uh, employed in uh, certain clinical trials focused on patients with PMS and other neurodevelopmental disorders. So in terms of uh, um, genotype-phenotype correlation, how can we apply the approaches that, that I described before? So deep phenotyping, uh, we use standardized questionnaires for remote assessment. I don't know if some of you that are in attendance have participated to uh, some of our questionnaires. We apply this method to uh, the study on seizures, the study on sleep, uh, we're applying now, it's currently ongoing on, for the study on speech and language impairment, uh, the study on behavioral disorders. So we use tools that have been validated. So we know that, that they've been used in other studies. They uh, have been uh, tested to be informative, to be standardized. And we apply them in order to collect the information that is comparable with other studies. And uh, um, that uh, builds up our clinical knowledge. Then. We used, of course, the uh, data hub to uh, the, yeah, the registry uh, to um, collect the information that was shared by, by the families. Then the second point 
the expanded genomic investigation, we looked at the correlation between uh, size of 22Q13 deletions and the severity of the symptoms, or the onset of new symptoms. Um, we also, in some of our studies, uh, sequenced nine candidate genes that map in the region, in the 22Q13 region, that eventually, even if they're not causing the disorder, because we, we sequenced these genes in patients that already had that uh, 22 q 13 deletion, but they may exert a modifying effect. So they might affect the severity of the uh, signs and symptoms presented by these patients. And then the third point is the functional characterization. So we use a technology developed by Biolog. It's called Phenotype Mammalian Microarray. And uh, it allows us to produce the energetic response. So to produce the, uh, to uh, measure the capacity of the cells to produce energy in a certain metabolic environment, specifically the production of a molecule called NADH. And if you can click on, you can see this is what the plate looks like at the end of the experiment. So the darker the well turns, as you can see, there is a path and some wells are darker than others, the more energy is produced. And so in each wells, in each well, we have different compounds and uh, those compounds can be um, used as energy sources. So some, some plates are designed to measure the energy production in the presence of different energy sources. Some other plates are designed to measure the energy production in the presence of metabolic effectors, such as ions, hormones, growth factors, cytokines. So molecules that send signals to the cells and regulate or modify their activities. And so, um, in the end, what we do is measuring the production of energy in each of these wells over a certain amount of time, usually 24 hours, and we compare that with controls. Like in this graphic, you can see the uh, comparison of the average of a patient cohort and the control cohort. And we have a color code where green is patients, red is controls, and when they overlap, you see yellow. So this allows us to have an idea, not only of the final product, so the final amount of NADH, but also the dynamic production of NADH. And it will show us how the cells work in different metabolic environments. So the first uh, trait that uh, uh, we're going to discuss is seizures. And we uh, recently published this paper uh, on the genetic and metabolic profiling of individuals with PMS uh, presented with, uh, with seizures. And we focused, uh, as I mentioned, on the three characteristics. So the clinical presentation, the genetic and genomic profile, and the metabolic uh, characterization. So in terms of clinical presentation, we looked at the different subtypes of seizures. We noticed that, uh, as you can see in this table, some of them like absence or tonic-clonic, also called grand mal, are more represented, but basically the most striking feature is that every sort of subtype has been described. So there is not really a prevalent seizure profile. Then the other important clinical uh, feature that we uh, looked at was the signs and behaviors associated with episodes of seizures. So the correlating, the, the contour, the correlating presentation around the, these episodes of seizures. And you can see here some some some. Then in terms of the genetic etiology, so what caused this, the, at the genetic point of view, what caused the seizures, we noticed that uh, they were more frequent in subjects with Shank 3 pathogenic variants, as you can see from the table, about 70% of individuals with Shank 3 variants presented with seizures, and in individuals with large deletions. So we looked at deletions in different categories, uh, and the ones above four megabases were more likely to present with seizures. So we have these two uh, subpopulations. Then, still uh, talking about genetics, when we looked at the distribution per uh, deletion size, we have cases with PMS presented with seizures, which are in the top half of the picture in the black bars, and then cases with PMS without seizures, without the gray, which are the gray bars in the bottom half. And you can see immediately from this picture that uh, if we draw a line, right there, most of the black bars, so most of the individuals with PMS 
and seizures present with deletions that are larger than, than deadline. And most of the individuals with PMS without seizures carry deletions that are smaller than that threshold. And uh, if you follow the arrow and you see, you see that at the bottom of that line, there is this, this gene, TBC1D22A, it's a long name, but the, uh, the point is that by looking at the deletion size, our genotype-phenotype correlation analysis suggested that this gene is likely a very good candidate for seizures in individuals with PMS. That means that individuals that have deletions encompassing this gene, so they have lost one copy of these genes, are more likely to have seizures. Then in terms of the metabolic profile, we have a reduced efficiency of major metabolic pathways, so a lower overall production of energy, and a correlation with the deletion size. So individuals with larger deletions who had more severe metabolic abnormalities. And then we also noticed abnormalities in the metabolism of tryptophan that was also tricked, uh, in, identified in individuals with autism, which we know is very common in PMS. And we noticed abnormalities in mitochondrial activity. Then the conclusions are that uh, uh, absence and tonic-clonic seizures are the most common subtypes in PMS, but there is not a unique subtype. Basically, every single type of seizures uh, has been described in this in this cohort. Um, most people uh, uh, present with present with seizures. Uh, sorry, most people with Shank three variants present with seizures, but there is also an other gene, TBC1D22A, that is a strong candidate gene. And then the, there are several disrupted metabolic pathways that may suggest possible biomarkers that can be used for early screening or for drug development. And with that, I will pass the word to Dr. Moffitt. Um, so earlier this summer, I was able to publish one of my papers for my dissertation that looked at um, the literature that is currently available on sleep and PMS, and then using the PMS data hub to kind of get a better idea of the prevalence and other signs and symptoms that these individuals experience. So from the literature, sleep disturbances and sleep disorders are used um, hand in hand. Um, so it's a broad category that encompasses any disruption that affects sleep. Um, common disturbances are sleep apnea, circadian rhythm disorders, which would include difficulty going to sleep, uh, frequent nighttime awakenings, and then difficulty returning to sleep, as well as parasomnias, which would include um, bedwetting and uh, night terrors and sleepwalking. So we know that um, abnormalities in sleep affect the metabolic and neurological processes of our brain. So many clinical trials are focusing on targeting these neurologic features. So from the literature that I was able to find, 85% um, of individuals with a developmental disability report having a type of sleep disturbance. Um, these sleep disturbances are very common, yet a very understudied feature of PMS. Um, this can also affect the identification, treatment, and management guidelines that families and caregivers are given to um, mediate these symptoms. Um, these disturbances not only affect the individual, but they affect family and caregivers. As we know, if the child doesn't sleep, the family doesn't sleep. So using the PMS data hub, I was able to find um, out of the whole um, cohort, we were able to narrow that down based on the information that we had from individuals from genetic data and all sleep data. So we had a total cohort of 384 individuals and out of those individuals, 282 presented with a type of sleep disturbance. So that's almost three quarters of our cohort. We also found that smaller deletion sizes, less than three megabases, and those with pathogenic variants in shank three were more likely to experience these disturbances. So sleep disturbances was also shown to be higher in individuals that were of 18 years or older. 
So in our cohort, we had 60 individuals that were 18 or, or older, and 54 of them experienced at least one type. Um, individuals with PMS experience an average of three different types of sleep disturbances, with the um, most common being frequent nighttime awakening, difficulty returning to sleep after a nighttime awakening, and difficulty falling asleep. So we were able to conclude that sleep disturbances are a very common feature of PMS, with 90% of adults experiencing at least one type. Um, Shank 3 is also the main candidate gene for sleep disturbances in PMS. And we recommended that individuals with PMS should be assessed for sleep disturbances as they are assessed for other common features such as seizures. So going off back to what Luigi was saying about uh, personalized treatment and analyzing the metabolic response, um, currently we are working on um, looking at IGF-1, so insulin-like growth factor one, and HGH, human growth, fact, growth hormone. Um, since they're being used in several clinical trials that are ongoing with uh, PMS and other developmental disorders. Um, currently, the preclinical identification of good and bad responders is what we're looking at. So we have a cohort of 48 individuals, and we separated them by the top 25 responders and the bottom 25 responders to both of these hormones. So IGF-1, like I said, is used in clinical trials and a few case studies um, have shown behavioral and social improvements when it's administered twice daily for three months. So far, that's all the clinical trials have um, conducted is three months. However, IGF-1 poses risk for a hypoglycemic event, and currently it's very costly and in short supply. So HGH um, has the ability to increase the IGF-1 levels in individuals without the risk of hypoglycemic event. Um, this has shown in a few case studies, improvements in motor skills, social behaviors when they are treated with HGH instead of IGF-1. So currently we are working on the functional characterization of that. So we did endophenotyping of PMS sub, sub cohorts. So our top 25 and our bottom 25 responders for each IGF-1 and HGH based on their metabolic profile using those biolog plates that Luigi mentioned earlier. Our goal is to see if we can potentially develop a biomarker that can be used to determine better patient selection for these clinical trials and possibly um, have a better understanding of what dose would be appropriate for these individuals. So we're using an in vitro assessment um, so we currently have 48 individuals, uh, PMS individuals, cell lines within our lab at Clemson that we are using to um, actually test HGH and IGF-1 on those. So based on just the separation of populations and looking at the metabolic profile, we determined that high responders for IGF-1 and HGH were pretty similar. So 11 out of these 12 individuals were the same between those two groups. And then our low responder group for IGF-1 and HGH was very similar as well with 10 individuals being the same across both. So these are the parametric graphs that Luigi mentioned earlier. As he said, green represents patient, red represents control, and then yellow is the overlap. So for our high responder group, we took all of our high responders, which was 12 individuals, and we compared it to a control group of 50. And as you can see, our high responders were very high across the whole plate. And this was true for all eight plates that we have used and tested them on. And then our low responder plates or a low responder group, when compared to that 50 control, showed that they produced less energy. And you can see where our control group was higher in most of those wells. So in conclusion, um, the PMS cells showed a disruption in the utilization of energy sources, 
ion species and tryptophan, which as Luigi said earlier, is very common in individuals with autism. Um, the PMS cohort can be stratified based on the response to IGF-1 or HGH, and we now consider those metabolic biomarkers. Um, this stratification has the potential to allow for better candidate selection for clinical trials, um, ways to identify candidates that are predisposed to a better response to IGF-1 or HGH, and to hopefully minimize adverse reactions, so those hypoglycemic events that are possible with IGF-1. All right, great. Now I'd like to show you some updates on a, a couple other uh, projects that we've worked on. We recently published a paper looking at kidney disorders and Phelan McDermott syndrome and looked for candidate genes. So we looked at, um, in this project, um, uh, this one we were looking based on what's been published in the literature. Uh, we were looking at candidate genes um, across, I think we had more than 200 people from the literature we were able to identify. And we currently have in progress one as assessment looking at information from the PMS data hub, where we're looking to see if we can identify candidate genes um, in addition to shank three that may increase the risk for developing kidney disorders. Um, so we'll be looking at, uh, looking at deletion size, which is a proxy measure for which genes are, which uh, additional genes are missing in addition to shank three and see if we can identify which are most related to kidney disorders. Um, another uh, really interesting project we have going on right now is an investigation into speech impairments in Phelan McDermott syndrome. And one of our doctoral students is a speech language pathologist, and she is uh, conducting the study right now. And the purpose was um, characterizing the language profile in Phelan McDermott syndrome using standardized language uh, instruments, um, as well as assessing the feasibility of doing a remote data um, uh, language assessment. And she is currently, um, she's still in the progress of doing this. Um, this was really spurred on, you know, with uh, pandemic, a lot of in-person meetings, as we know, the PMS conference has, is now going on virtually. Um, it's been a lot harder to do in-person data collection. And so this was a, also an investigation to see how um, feasible it is to do language assessments uh, remotely using Zoom or WebEx or something like this. Um, and so far it's looking quite um, productive. So this was a pilot study of 15 uh, school-aged children. We're actually, I think, up to 17 now. Um, so she is compiling both uh, medical and school records. She's doing her virtual language assessment. So just like this with a um, parent and child. Um, and then we'll, we're collecting saliva to do some um, uh, whole exome sequencing on a few of those individuals. She'll then be doing statistical and bioinformatics um, analysis and hopefully to uh, further investigate candidate genes that might be contributing to the uh, speech and communication difficulties in Phelan McDermott syndrome in addition to Shank 3, um, really get a good handle on the communication profile. And from this, we hope to improve um, diagnosis, prognosis, and specific recommendations for speech uh, therapy. Okay, I think I covered those items. So this, this project is in uh, data collection right now. And um, another feature that we heard from families was of concern was lymphedema. So following um, a similar approach that we found to be very productive, we first look at the literature and then we're looking at the data hub, the PMS data hub based on their registry information. Um, we're correlating the uh, genetic deletions um, among people who have lymphedema and comparing it to those who don't have lymphedema, what's different? So we're hoping to identify uh, candidate genes related to lymphedema and improved um, screening suggestions. And now I'm really happy to introduce Sneha Shah, who has expertise in bioinformatics, and she's doing her PhD at Clemson, specifically in bioinformatics, and she's been using some new techniques to look at neurological features. Thank you, so, thank you so much, Dr. Sarasova. So my work focuses on identifying um, 
genes on the 22Q13 region that have been associated with the commonly comorbid uh, phenotypes of uh, PMS, specifically autism, uh, intellectual disability, language impairment, seizure, and hypertonia. So for doing this project, um, I'm using a already existing database called as the BrainSpan data, which consists of RNA, seq uh, RNA sequences extracted from MRA, uh, microarrays uh, of brain tissues um, and different regions of the brain tissues. So what I do is I take the gene expressions, I find out the co-expression between them using clustering algorithm. Um, Dr. Saraswat, could you just have a quick please? Uh, so what they basically said that genes that share same expression patterns are likely to have similar functionalities. So based on this cluster, we develop a network these network resembles co-expression gene modules, which basically identifies which particular module is highly expressing for autism or intellectual disability. And using that information, I try to identify potential or candidate genes on the 22Q13 region that could be associated to autism or intellectual disability or seizures or hypotonia. And that's how I'm trying to identify candidate uh, genes on 22Q13 region that could be associated to these commonly neurological phenotypes um, and identify genes which correlates to PMS as well. So that's my project. Over to you, Dr. Sarsula. All right, thank you so much, Nihal. Um, just um, a few thoughts about future directions for our research. Uh, one is, um, we've got a picture of a fish. We're interested in developing zebrafish models. So when I first heard about using zebrafish models, I was a little bit surprised, like fish, really. Um, but as it turns out, about 70% of the genes for um, structural features are similar between fish and humans. So if we're going to look at um, something like kidney disorders or growth, we might be able to use, um, investigate some of these candidate genes in a fish model, which is a lot more uh, rapid turnover than maybe some others. So we're going to investigate developing that. Uh, we're looking also at investigating other clinical features. So we've looked at kidney disorders, lymphedema, speech, seizures. So we're investigating uh, and we're interested in hearing back uh, feedback from families on the clinical features that are of most interest. Um, we're going to expand our work using machine learning and bioinformatics approaches because those seem to be productive, um, especially in the era of big data. Um, and so we've really made, um, I think, good use and we'll be doing more with the PMS Data Hub. Um, and then we're going to be doing more work looking for uh, targets for novel treatments in Bailey McDermott syndrome. So uh, for acknowledgments, we want to thank um, the people who have Phelan McDermott syndrome and their families um, who have been so supportive. Have, um, it, when, we, when you've been to conferences, it's really helpful to talk and hear, hear what, what's important to you all. Um, we've received some grant support that we want to acknowledge. So we've had support from the Hope for 22 Q13 Gala. Um, we've um, had support uh, from Prisma Health, which is our hospital system here in South Carolina, who funded our um, speech study, um, our college at Clemson University, our College of Behavioral, Social, and Health Sciences, uh, who support us with an impact grant. And of course, we, um, we, um, we're, what would we do without the PMS um, Foundation and the Data Hub? So we've had tremendous support um, resources there. So um, we appreciate um, all that support. And We've given you a, a bit of a glimpse of the work that we have going on at Clemson in the PMS Research Initiative. We have a couple new graduate students um, starting soon who we're hoping to put on some new projects. So that's um, pretty exciting. And Andy, how about I turn it over to you? I can stop sharing. That's, that's, that's fine with me. Um, <clears throat> well, uh, I took five pages of notes. Um, and uh, my fingers are tired of writing, so um, I, I'm looking at the uh, in, 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 I, uh, participants can leave questions in the Q&A, and I'm keeping an eye on that. Um, I'm not very good at multitasking, but you know, 
uh, somebody raise their hand if they see something come up and I miss it. Um, but I think, you know, it's worth uh, um, be part of my role to uh, begin by asking some questions. And I have lots of very detailed scientific questions, uh, mostly because this is all interesting science stuff. But I, I try and thinking of what might be important to parents, other parents. Um, the thing that jumped out at me uh, from all the talks was um, was the uh, sleep study and the observation that um, uh, uh, shank three variants and small deletions um, uh, uh, took up the larger percentage of people with PMS in terms of sleep disturbances. And that's very interesting in, in that, you know, it, it, it brings the big scientific question called why? And, and it, you know, is it is that there were missing something in, in larger deletions? I wouldn't expect that people know when they're not sleeping. Uh, and as a parent, I can tell you, if your kid doesn't sleep, you're not sleeping. Um, so is there something protective about a larger deletion? Should you be drawing your arrows, you know, through, through um, um, deletion size studies and pointing to some gene that might actually, uh, the deletion of which, you know, ameliorates some of the sleep disturbance problems. So, so I'd like you to ad address that. And, and in, in just to make things complicated for you, um, um, I also would like you to address whether or not um, you feel this same approach can be used for psychiatric regression, which shows the exact same properties. Um, and, and, and then finally, I, I think you should hand this off to each person. Um, um, what role does, does you know, metabolic, um, um, you know, the brain's ability to manage uh, uh, met metabolic resources impact sleep and psychiatric uh, regression? It, these are the questions that jump out at me as a parent. Okay, um, so I will tackle the first question about deletion size. So after looking at all of the data, um, we were surprised that, you know, small deletion sizes um, were correlated to being more prominent with sleep disturbances. And after, you know, bringing the discussion to everyone in this room, we were thinking that probably what it is, is um, individuals with larger deletion size of more severe phenotype. So possibly it could be that there are sleep disturbances in these individuals with larger deletion sizes, but maybe that's not the prominent um, issue that these families are having. Maybe, you know, they can deal with, you know, lack of sleep because, you know, maybe their seizures are so severe that, you know, sleep just doesn't really happen and they're focusing on um, these other clinical features. Would you like to? Yeah, no, no, I, I completely agree. And of course, this was the product of a collegial, you know, brainstorm or, you know, interpretation. Um, I think that uh, as we observed uh, for uh, other neurobehavioral disorders like uh, autism, you know, there is also a similar trend that, or at least there used to be. And I think there is an ascertainment bias there. Families are more focused on um, traits that uh, are more impactful, like seizures. Uh, they require more critical medical attention, and they tend to overlook the, the sleep disturbances. And that is why we, we added as uh, one of the uh, closing remarks that uh, individual PMS should be assessed for sleep disturbances, just as they are assessed for other neurological features, because it is a neurological trait. It might actually be a, a marker for more severe neurological impairments, and it should be assessed more systematically. With using the PMS Data Hub, we actually um, had to take into consideration that um, sleep norms, and not just sleep norms across the United States, but sleep norms in Europe. And luckily, we have Luigi, who has you know knowledge of you know norms that are kind of foreign to us who are from America. So we had these discussions. Well, in America, 
if your child is still sleeping in your bed at seven, eight years old, we would find that an issue. Whereas in Europe, that might not be an issue. So it could be um, underreported of sleep disturbances that people culturally don't feel is an issue. Yeah, I agree, of course. And uh, I will uh, um, add that uh, when we talk about standardized tools, that's the kind of issues that we, we have to face because you can ha you cannot have something that is standardized across the world. There are social cultural backgrounds, social cultural influences that uh, do affect the way you assess for, for certain traits. Um, and I will use that to go to the next point, the one about uh, psychiatric regression, that is very hard to assess, of course, because unlike other conditions with regression, like uh, isolated autism, they usually has a, a typical uh, age for regression around you know, the two years of age. In PMS, you may have uh, different ages. You may have regression about around six months. You may have regression about two years or uh, seven years, adolescence. Uh, but the problem is you may have regression that affects different neurocognitive or neuromotor areas. So um, Andy mentioned uh, rightfully the psychiatric regression is that's one of the most relevant access, aspects, but uh, it's it's really difficult to assess that. And I can tell, you know, at cost of spoiling our own, you know, efforts, this is one of the future goals, you know, one of the, the future traits that we want to investigate because it's so challenging, it, it, it's so complicated, but uh, it's, it's also so important for the families, you know, Having a child that has reached, has achieved certain milestones, and then all of a sudden these milestones are fading or even disappearing entirely. Why? Why some cases do have it, but some cases don't. I remember we, we have in the community um, a case with, with two um, twin sisters. One of them um, has severe regression. Um, and uh, why is that so? Well, just one of the, the two. Uh, and why certain areas might be affected and certain areas preserved. So yeah, definitely that is, as I was mentioning, see, I wasn't lying that Andy is a great fund, a source of inspiration for us. You know, we were thinking about that before, but obviously we are aligned. Um, regression is a major topic that deserves further investigation. And then uh, um, the last, uh, I don't know if Sarah wants to, or? No, I think that's fine. Okay. I can take that. Okay, you, you go. Um, so currently we are finishing up a project that was similar to the seizure paper that Luigi mentioned, where we're looking at um, the genetic, metabolic, um, and then uh, using clinical surveys of individuals with sleep disturbances. So we are looking at the metabolic profile and from what I remember, we have their complete different profiles, except for the tryptophan, which as we've said is very common in individuals with autism and seems to be very prevalent within our current P PMS cohort. So we're working on getting that out. We're working with clinical psychologists um, to analyze these clinical surveys so that we can have a better grasp of um, correlating the genetic metabolic and clinical features that are experienced um, with this group of individuals. But we, we do see a difference in metabolic profile between individuals who experience sleep disorders and those that do not. Yeah. Okay, that's great. It's all really good. And, and um, it, it's, um, it feels like uh, out of this program, um that, that that you've developed um this becomes more of a two-way street now right you you use the data hub as uh, an information resource yet now you're identifying um refinements to how to collect uh, phenotype information uh you know how to what questionnaires and so forth it, it sounds like um this is very much of a two-way street with uh, what's going on with the foundation. And if I may add, that is a very important point because actually in the eyes of many researchers, uh, using a, a parental referral as a source of information may not seem very um, 
validated or a very um how can i put that um trustworthy from the scientific point of view because it has not been filtered by a physician but by comparing these different sources the uh, registry or the you know repository and the standardized questions we can actually validate that and we can actually by by overlapping these sources we can say see you can trust when it comes to certain types of uh, objective features or, you know objective uh, clinical signs and symptoms because of course implementing a, a protocol of data collection based on standardized questionnaires will take time will take resources and if we already have uh, um, data of uh, comparable quality in the biorepository, by comparing these two things, we can validate that the repository like the registry, or we can say, you know, we can send out a warning like these sort of features might not be as accurate as the ones that we can collect through standardized questions. At least we know. So it might be a way to improve the registry, or it might be a way to select the, the type of data that can be used from the registry. And, and I would like to add on for that two-way street is um, I think it's really helpful to hear from, from families what features they're most concerned about. So when we hear that, then we can put some effort into investigating those features. So um, we, would, we would welcome that to hear what are the clinical areas that families are most interested in having um, explored or better understood? Well, I, I hope that, that uh, the people listening today and the people who watch this recording later take the time to sit down and, and, um, and, and see if there's something they can think of that would be uh, amenable to the kinds of work that you're doing. Um, on a different note, this is one of my favorite questions. If you won the lottery for 10 or $100 million, um, you know, um, what would you be asking for? And, and I, I want to give you, uh, uh, try to help you with the answer. And, you know, uh, um, six, seven years ago would have been um, a, uh, a microarray for everybody, you know, with Phelan McDermott syndrome. Um, you know, last year might have been a, a whole exome sequencing for everybody with Phelan McDermott syndrome. Um, but now you have RNA seq and and you know metabolomics and 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 all these other you know um, highly informative, highly detailed, personalized information. And of course, you you you're building your bioinformatics ability to manage all that data. So. You know, maybe your first million will be another computer, but, uh, you know, I'd like to hear from you. Um, what do you see as um, uh, funding priorities for, for large things, for large scale? Um, I think it's really this, the, the big data approach, I think is really exciting. And um, I think it's really helpful with this data hub to have this centralized data repository. So I would probably put a bunch of money toward the data hub because if we have individual researchers doing individual projects, you kinda, we kind of need to bring, bring it all together. So if there can be a coordinated data collection, I think that would be really helpful. So the more patients you have involved in a study, um, usually you need more, more sample sizes to be able to, to have meaningful findings. Um, and I think probably putting money into bioinformatics uh, expertise, um, big data analytics, um, statistical expertise will be um, a big factor. So definitely that would be one. And I would add along that line, um, you mentioned whole exome, I would push it even forward. And uh, um, I would say whole genome for everybody, but also um, probably whole epigenome, like looking at the non-genetic -gen uh, um, factors, uh, you know, epigenetics uh, is uh, sort of an interface between our genome and our environment. So uh, try to trying to characterize all the elements that might eventually affect the clinical presentation. We now have the knowledge, we're, we're having, you know, we're acquiring the tool, I'm saying acquiring because it's not um, available, you know, the, the, the 
an expensive cost in the market. So it, it, it's a process. Uh, and now it's time to put the pieces together. Uh, you, some people may wonder why we are uh, insisting so much on uh, genetic components once we already have a genetic cost. We already have a deletion, we already have a point variant. Why we are insisting? Because of the variability. Because we the diagnosis doesn't answer all the questions. And uh, you mentioned a perfect example like regression. Why some patients that have similar deletions or similar point mutations, why some develop regression and some don't? Uh, so there must be something else. So in order to get to that point of providing precision medicine, we need to acquire all the information, the genomic information, even beyond 22Q13, epigenomic information, and eventually also environmental information. I would agree. I would, I'm more lab focused. So I would say I would like that for incubators so I can grow PMS cell lines and be able to, you know, test all these new drugs that are out on the market to determine, you know, what works, what doesn't, what works for this person and doesn't for the other. So definitely all of the above. And if I might add something, I know it may sound cheesy, but in the end, the best resources that money can't, can't buy are still human resources. So I just want to say we're so happy and so proud we were able to hire our Bridget, our daughter Moffitt, right after her graduation or PhD, because as you might have noticed from this presentation, her brilliant skills put to work on, on PMS are really allowing us to make such an amazing progress and to, to improve our knowledge so much. And I think this is valuable more than any machine. Well, I, I, I want to comment as somebody who, who does train um, uh, people uh, in, in science that uh, the presentation, her presentation, your presentation, Bridget, was really excellent. And, Thank and you. I, can, I, I, I see that um, their, their time and training and, and efforts uh, in, in uh, having you join them is well spent, and that's, that's nice. I wanted, to touch, I wanted to touch on some things that other people have asked me. I get a lot of questions among the families. Uh, being a, a PMS dad, I'm on the family page and I get a lot of questions. And so I'm just, I'm, I'm relaying some of those. Um, and one that, that comes up often actually is are questions about diet and questions about environment. And uh, um, full disclosure, um, Luigi invited me to uh, contribute a small amount to a paper uh, on um, the, the role of environment in, in genetics. And so, um, uh, but I, I would like to hear from him. Um, your, your knowledge about how things like diet impacts or potentially impacts uh, Fallon McDermott syndrome um, presentation and, 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 and people's issues. Well, thank you, Andy. And uh, it wasn't a small contribution at all. It was very important, by the way. Um, so th there are no uh, systematic studies on uh, diet and PMS, and that, that's, that's a problem. But there are studies that focus on certain genes or certain uh, presentations that might be uh, more prominent in individuals that have lost certain genes. Of course, if we consider larger deletions, there are more genes lost, and therefore there are more pathways, more metabolic pathways disrupted, and therefore there, there is more margin for uh, dietary factors to have an impact on a clinical presentation. Um, I like to cite the, the case of uh, PMPLA3, which is a gene that is quite proximal. So it's about uh, 4.5 megabases from the telomere, which means about uh, 4 million and a half nucleotides from shank three at the end of the chromosome. And that gene has been well known in the field of liver disease. Now, individuals may carry variants in that gene, but if you lost for the 22Q13 deletion, uh, the copy of the gene without variant, you basically unmask the variant on the remaining copy. 
So this is a condition that taken individually wouldn't seem very um, relevant because if people are heterozygous, so they're carrying one copy of the gene with the variant, they might not have a high risk of developing uh, liver disease. But of course, if that one copy is the only copy, then the impact is, is high. Also, the thing is, um, as we discussed procedures, in many cases, gastrointestinal disorders, digestive disorders are really underestimated and understudied in, uh, in syndromic conditions, in particular in PMS. Because once again, there are more um, concerning uh, issues. Uh, there are things that uh, catch more uh, attention in terms of uh, uh, medical care. And so parents uh, or um, caregivers or even physicians uh, don't have the possibility of properly observe and characterize gastrointestinal issues. But the problem is that um, they might reflect on other features. So if you have a liver disease, you might have a problem in metabolizing several compounds, including drugs. Therefore, the standard treatment for certain neurological features, such as seizures, might be less effective in individual PMS because their liver is not processing the drugs properly. And that includes, for example, another gene, um, CYP2D6, that is part of the family of uh, um, liver cytochromes that are the enzymes that uh, uh, really uh, process and metabolize drugs and other compounds. So the impact of the diet, as for many other things, is uh, always variable and depends on the genetic background of the individuals. But there is a way to categorize certain types of uh, predispositions. So um, in the PMS population, there are individuals that might be more sensitive to um, diet uh, um, factors, like uh, you know, a fat diet, a fattening diet might affect your liver. And therefore, if you already have the PMPLA3 variant, and you're, you're not uh, following a healthy diet or you're not removing fat from your diet, you may be more at risk of developing a liver disease. Diane, I'm, I'm happy to turn it to you. And, and um, I want to thank, uh, first, I want to thank all the speakers. Um, uh, it was really, uh, it's, it's exciting for another scientist, but it's also, I hope, um, equally exciting to all the families that. Um, that um, so much is being done and, and uh, being done on a broad scale and, and um, with, 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 you know, mind to expand it even more. Uh, that's, uh, thank you all for your work and, uh, and, um, and, and here's to seeing even more great work coming out. Uh, Diane, thank you for um, taking over. Thank okay. you so much. Thank, thank you. you, Andy. And yeah, and thank you, everyone. Thank you all so much for what you do. Thank you. Thank you.